I went into the mafia when I was like 23. I was involved in three mafia wars. I was involved in 19 murders. I did my first hit. It was a guy in the crew. Shorty came back to me and he says, you got this contract, kill him. When we pulled out and we were going down the road, I took out my gun and I shot him in the back of the head. He didn't move and I shot him again. We opened the car, I pulled him out, I threw him on the grass. I got back in the car, opened the window, I shot him three more times. We went to his funeral, looking down at him when I went to the coffin, and then turning around, PC and people crying. You know, when you're dead, you don't feel nothing, but the people around you suffer. And I saw that, that bothered me a lot. Damn, damn, Sonny. I want to thank you for taking the time to sit with me and uh, chat with me a little bit. Uh, for, for my audience so who may not know you and haven't seen you speak and tell your story, and I want them to really understand the, the, the real involvement that you have with the mafia and your story. So. Would you mind introducing yourself a little bit, however you please, so people can get to know you? Yeah. My name is Salvatore Gravano. They, I'm called Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano. It's called Sammy the Bull. I got that reputation as a kid when I was fighting. I fought a couple of older kids, and uh, they said he fought like a bull. That name stuck up with me, and uh, I wore it till today. So uh, uh, I was uh, uh, became... Uh, I went into the mafia when I was like 23, and I became the underboss of the most powerful organized crime family in the country. I was involved in three mafia wars. I was involved in 19 murders. I did over 22 years of my life in prison. Um, and when I got out just recently in 2017, I started doing social media. I'm working on a couple of people, uh, more movies, the story of my life, something similar to The Sopranos. I can't really talk that about that, but um, because I'm under contract, but we're working on that. It'll be out in the near future. So uh, I think that's about it so, so far. far. And then we'll just yeah, have we're just, we're just getting this going, but I appreciate that intro. So again, with the conversation that I usually speak about, I told you, you know, it's it's, it's normalizing the conversation to death. Uh, a lot of it is grief related, but my interest in with your story and what you spoke about openly is the perspective of death with you in particular that has been around it in a more aggressive, violent way, if you will. And so I'm curious with you, how do you, what, what is that? How do you get to that point of taking someone else's life? Like, would you start with the first, the first hit or the first killing that you've been involved in? Well, I, I will. And I'll go a little bit before that. Uh, when I was a kid, I was dyslexic. I had trouble in school. Uh, I joined the gang. I was out of school. I, I didn't get past the eighth grade. Um, and I joined the gang. It was the Rampers. And uh, I didn't kill anybody or do anything like that. None of us did. But we did gang fights and stuff like that and hanging around with you know, nice young girls and stuff. And um, later uh, in life, I was 19 years old. I got drafted into the military and they trained you how to kill. It was during the Vietnam War. And of course, that's what you're required to do, fighting for our country and, and killing the, the enemy. And uh, I got out two years later, honorable discharge, and I went right back into a gang. And while I was gone, my gang members all hooked up with mafia groups, different mafia groups. So, uh, at the age of 23, I hooked up with somebody, a friend of mine took me to this guy, Shorty Spiro, who was a boss, not the boss of the family, but he was a heavyweight in the Colombo family. And uh, I made an alliance, an agreement, and I joined with him. That's how I got involved in my first mafia war. And uh, I did my first hit. Um, it was a guy in the crew, a guy named Joe Colucci. Um, his wife uh, was having an affair with Shorty's nephew, who's one of the guys in the crew. And uh, he decided that he wanted to take out uh, Shorty and me. And he asked one of the guys for help. And the guy said, why would you want to shoot, kill Sammy? He's not having an affair with your wife. He's not fucking around with her. And um, he said, well, if I kill Tommy Spiro, who's having the affair with my wife, Shorty's going to understand and know it, and he'll kill me. And who's he going to send to kill me? He'll probably send Sammy. 
So if I kill Sammy and Shorty now, there'll be so much confusion. Six months down the road, I'll get this kid Tommy and I'll do what I got to do. Frankie didn't buy this thing and help him. He went to Shorty and he told him what he was being asked. Shorty went to uh, Carmine Persico, who went to Joe Colombo, who was the boss of the Colombo family, told him about it. Joe Colombo ordered this guy, Joe Colucci, to be killed. Shorty came back to me and he says, you got this contract, kill him. Um, he asked me who I wanted on the hit to help me. I wanted Frankie because he's the one who went to you. I wanted to know if I wasn't being bullshitted. I didn't understand why this guy would want to kill me. Um, so I wanted to verify it in my own way. And then I wanted his nephew Tommy on the hit because he created this monster. And I took both of them on the hit. We all hung out together. We went to clubs. And one night at a club, late at night, 4 o'clock in the morning, we left this club. We went and go to an all-night restaurant. We had a little breakfast. And when we got back in the car, Tommy Sparrow was driving. Joe Colucci sat in the passenger seat. I sat in the back along with Frankie. And... Uh, when we pulled out and we were going down the road, I took out my gun and I shot him in the back of the head. He didn't move. And I shot him again in the back of the head. He slid to the side. We went out of the neighborhood. We went to a, a high-end neighborhood where there was nice homes and a lot of land in between them. We pulled over in an area. We opened the car, I pulled him out, I threw him on the grass, I got back in the car, opened the window, I shot him three more times. And we left, we went home, and uh, there's a lot more to that story, but that was my first hit. What do you remember from that? I was very... In regards to, like, I know you just, you've recollected the story very vividly, but in regards to actually taking action and stepping up to do that. Is there any correlation between when you went to war and like you said, you, you said you, you have orders, you know, when you're, when you're in war, you have orders from, from above and you're trained to kill. Is there a correlation with that, that decision to actually take someone's life in the hierarchy of the mafia? Cause you know, you have your soldiers, your captains. Is it, do you see it the same way? Absolutely. We join them. You know, it's like being in the military you're there to protect Cosa Nostra, the mafia. We call it Cosa Nostra. And um, there's different ranks. There's associates. I was an associate. There's maid members. Above the maid member is a captain. Um, above him is the administration, the boss, the underboss, and the consigliere of the family. And uh, you're part of that family. And um, you do what you're told. Now, there was good reason. Uh, Frankie told me that he did come to him, and the story was true. Now, if you're going to plot to kill somebody, you better hope it don't come out. In his case, it did come out, and uh, I was ordered to do what I had to do. That was my first hit. The strange part of it is I was nervous. Um... And I, I thought that I saw movies and I thought that, you know, I saw movies when a guy kills somebody, he starts shaking and he's sweating and he's scared and all of these things happen. When we got done, uh, we went to an apartment to go to sleep. We were all living together, a couple of us. And uh, I went in the shower, leaned against the wall, let the warm water go up through my hair, on my back and chest and... I was waiting for that to happen to me. That didn't happen. I didn't feel anything. I, I, nothing changed. Um, I got dried off and went to bed. I slept like a baby. I got up the next morning. So many young girls and people were in the apartment. Oh, my God, they killed Joe Colucci. It was in the newspaper. They left him in... Uh, this area and stuff. I remember asking one of the girls, did they, did they know who did it? And she said, no, they were investigating it, but uh, 
and everybody went to the corner to hang out. And I remember I came out of the apartment. I went downstairs to the corner, and I felt I was way above the crowd. It's like I had a out of body experience, and I was way above the crowd, looking down, listening to the people talking. I felt like I wasn't part of them, but I was overseeing the whole thing. And I just wasn't feeling anything. And then my friend Tommy Spiro came over to me and said, Shorty's here. He wants us to get in the car. And he wants to go downtown to see Carmine Persico to report what happened. So when I got in the car with Shorty, we were going downtown to see Carmine Persico. And uh, he said, don't say nothing, Sammy. My nephew, Tommy, will explain exactly what happened. And uh, I said, okay. We went down there. They explained, Tommy explained to him what happened, called my Persico, and uh, he looked at me, came over, he kissed me on the cheek, hugged me, said, Sammy, great job. And uh, told me to leave, and I left. And that was my first hit. And uh, we went to his funeral, and uh, that part bothered me a lot. You know, looking down at him when I went to the coffin and then turning around, PC and people crying, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, when you're dead, you don't feel nothing. But the people around you suffer, and I saw that. That bothered me a lot. But um, I didn't feel any remorse or anything like that. When you're in the life you're going to expect, you break rules or you do something crazy that you can lose your life. That's exactly what he did. That's the reason why he lost his life. It was justified in my mind, in the mafia's mind. They didn't just take this life for no reason at all. There's a difference. It's the same thing to me, like you just brought up in the military. I would have went to Vietnam, I would have killed people because they were going to come here and they were going to rape our mothers and sisters and people and they were, we're going to become a communist country. They bullshit you when you're a kid. I knew that was bullshit later on after the war. I never met, I was never in prison, I was in prison 22 years, I never met a, an Asian person. Well, once or twice I met an Asian person in prison. So either they're good crooks and they don't get caught or uh, there's not that many of them that are bad boys. So and the only Vietnamese people I've ever met is women who do your toenails, fingernails, and stuff like that. And they seem to be all good people. So all that bullshit about them coming here and attacking us and we were going to become communists, it was all bullshit. It's to brainwash you. The mafia seems to have that same pattern as the military and you start to get orientated just like you're in the military. So that was my first hit. And when you say first hit, you, you, you said 19. You confessed to 19 different murders? Yes. I, don't, I didn't kill them all. I'm, some places I'm a, part of, I'm a part of 19 murders. Sometimes I'm a shooter. Sometimes I'm a planner. Um, and I became very, very efficient as a hit guy. I was good in business. I'm efficient in business and certain things. And it, there was no different. And as a hit guy, I became very, very efficient. I'm very good at it. And I was asked many times to go and do a piece of work. Not necessarily the shooter, but the planner and stuff right. like that. Oh, damn. Damn, Sammy. Okay, so when, you, when you're saying you, you, know, you didn't feel remorse even the first time you, you did that, what, what is that? What is that introspection? What does that what does that say about yourself for you personally, your own viewpoint on yourself when you didn't feel remorse, but you felt remorse at the funeral when you're seeing people grieving? Because I understand what you're saying about how you're comparing, you know, war in the streets with the mafia and there's there's that the rules and 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 whatnot. But when you're seeing yourself taking someone's life and you caught then due to that action, you're causing the grief and pain of the people around that person, even though that person you killed is part of the game. What, what does that tell you about yourself in regards to no remorse, but you felt something at the funeral? When you go into the mafia later in 1976, I became a made member. 
I was 31. I became, I was switched from the uh, Colombo family to the Gambino family. And then I got made in 1976. In 1977, I became an acting captain. Um, We understand when we're in the mafia that there's rules. We have to abide by their rules, their logic, everything about it, just like the military, so to speak. And um, when you break the rules, you die. That's just the way it is. So that's how they control people who are hit guys or tough guys. Without that, you would have anarchy. You can't control people. So you have to have that in place. In the military, when they lose control of you, they have a court martial, they could put you to death. There's a lot of things they could do too. So it's the same thing, similar, not the same thing, but it's very similar. Um, so you learn to live with that. A lot of times I would have asked, weren't you afraid on a hit or something like that? I said, no. The reason I said no is not that I don't have any fear. Um, you and I have fears, but I knew when I was in the mafia, I said to myself, sooner or later, at some point, you're going to get killed or you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life. And that re- pushed fear away from me. I was expecting it. I didn't think it wouldn't happen. I thought it would happen. It was not that it was going to happen. It was just when. When is it going to happen? So I try to keep my life clean and honest, not be a backstabber, not to be doing certain things or break certain rules. And uh, so I live my life that way. And uh, But I understand when you break the rules, um, you know, I don't feel sorry for you. You knew the rules, you broke them, You either fucked somebody, robbed them, you fucked somebody's wife you shouldn't have been. You can't fuck around with a made guy's wife, especially knowing it. If you do, or his daughter, you do something like that, and they find out, they're going to kill you. So there's rules that are set in stone. You know that. So if you did something like that, I have no qualms with killing you. You killed yourself. I may have pulled the trigger. I may have been part of it in some fashion, but you did it. You killed yourself. You committed suicide. And if you get an order, especially when you become a maid member to kill, if you refuse, they'll kill you. You can't refuse. So if you break a rule, I'm not going to refuse to kill you. I'm not going to lose my life because you're a fucking asshole and you kill, bang somebody's wife or rob somebody or did something so fucking fucked up. I'm not dying with you or for you. I'm going to be part of your murder. And that's the way it's done. That's That's the life. That's the lifestyle you're in. If you don't like it, then get the fuck out or don't join. Don't be part of it. So that's the way it is. You learn to live with that, uh, within the rules of Gozenostra. Now, the rules of Gozenostra, not just a gang anymore. It's Italians, a lot of Sicilians, and it's part of our heritage. It goes back years before we were born in Italy and Sicily. Now, I can go back into that, how it started. It started in Sicily and Sicily only and then spread all over Italy and then spread into different countries. And it was formed in Italy that in Sicily especially, people would invade Sicily to go attack Rome. Rome was very, very powerful. So what they did is they landed in Sicily because it wasn't powerful. There was a very small police force Most of the people were farmers and peasants. So they would invade there until they built up a big enough army ship by ship by ship to go invade Rome. So while they were in Sicily, they raped the women, they abused the people there, and they formed clans, family members, brothers, cousins, neighbors, 
because these small villages, it was like everyone was related. So the men got together. I remember one story. There was a guy who was a head of a clan. It was a clan. It wasn't mafia. It was clan. And they said Joe Blow's daughter was raped last night. And the guy, the head guy, said, by whom? And they said, those two soldiers, they pointed them out. They named them and pointed them out. The women are away from the table. The men are sitting down, drinking wine, eating, and discussing this. And the guy in the head of the clan says, what we have to do is get those two soldiers, kill them in the most brutal way we could, cut off their dick, and jam it into their fucking mouth. We want them found that way. And they did that. To protect their people. The next day they called 10 people out in the town. They called the whole town out, but they picked 10 people. Men, women, and children. And they said to the town, tell us who killed these soldiers or we'll kill these 10 people, all of them, men, women, and children. Now, the crowd is related to them. It's either their daughter, their son, their husband, or whoever was in that crowd knew that was their family member, and they knew who did it. But they felt that they were doing that to protect the people in the villages. Not one person told who it was, and they killed all 10 of them. Of course, they suffered, they cried, they moaned, they whatever. But they never gave up the clan leaders or who, they, who did it because they, had, they were men of honor who protected them. They may have lost some people, but they protected the rest of them. If they didn't protect the rest of them, then they would all fall prey to being raped and abused there was no police. These people took over and would do anything. It's almost like what you see in war pictures. And eventually those clans became Cosa Nostra, the mafia. And uh, it became such a powerful thing that the soldiers wouldn't touch the women anymore. They wouldn't do crazy stuff because they said, these fucking grease balls will kill you. And even if you kill them, they don't give a fuck. So that scared them a little bit, the, the, the different armies and people and soldiers, and they backed up. They wouldn't rape the women. They wouldn't do certain things. So those men became men of honor. And it wasn't about money. It wasn't about greed. It wasn't about anything. It was about more or less like if you watch the movie, an underground group of people who fought for their people, killed for their people. And then, of course, it got distorted through the years and changed into a little bit of greed and a little bit of everything else. And uh, so to the people in the towns, those people were heroes, men of honor. And then these things grew in different parts of Italy, and then it moved into places into the United States. Um, it's a whole long story about the history of the mafia. I won't get into that, I get back to me. And uh, so when I looked at the mafia, to me as an Sicilian, Sicilian, my mother was Sicilian, my father was Sicilian, I know the heritage of it. It's part of my heritage. It's not just a gang running around when I was younger. This is part of my heritage. Goes an ocean. And I lived that with that in my heart. And uh, and that's how I started and I stayed in and I became, like I said, I became the under, I got made, I became an acting captain, I became the underboss of the most powerful organized crime family in the country. And I was used 19 different times, including the first one, 18 other times in different murders, plots, plans. I sat at that table like the old grace balls did 
many, many times. Whew. So in regards to you being in the mafia and, and all that you've taken part of, anyone that is in the mafia is part of the game and signs up for this. So innocent people, women and children, you're saying, are, they're not, they can't be touched. No, and we don't go after, we don't kill innocent women and children. What most of the times in the murders in the mafia are people who broke our own rules. It's us. We get killed. Mainly 9% of the murders that happen is that. Now, there could be a, a shootout or somebody got shot by accident or something happened that wasn't even planned. Um, so, uh, and those things happened, but what the planning of murders is mostly us. We kill each other when we break the rules or we lose control. I'll give you an example. A guy named Roy DeMeo was a, a made guy, heavyweight, a killer. And after a while, he just came, it, he became a serial killer. He was killing people for no fucking reason. And uh, it was found out by the rest of us, the mafia. And that became his reputation. And we killed him for that reason. We don't have serial killers. We won't accept serial killers. And we killed him. Um, if we know a guy in the neighborhood is a rapist or a child molester, if he lives in our neighborhood, sooner or later he'll get killed. Once we really know that he that's what he is, then we kill outside of our group. We kill him to protect our community, our neighborhood. That's when we kill outside of ourselves. We'll kill a, a serial killer, a rapist, and a child molester. Those people will wind up with a target on their back and they'll be killed by us. And anything else outside of that, like say, uh, say a guy that's not part of the mafia or a part of that, does something to harm one of your own that is not also not like your family member or someone you know, is that still means, outside of those four re big reasons that you just named, they usually just get roughed up? Like, at what point is, is crossing the line to decide to kill someone? They could get roughed up. They get roughed up. But when you go in that neighborhood, they all, every, the neighborhood, everybody knows who you are. And they, and, and they, they kind of understand, and they, they're not going to fuck with you. They're, they're just not. And actually, growing up their neighborhoods, they literally protect you because they know that basically you're keeping that other evil shit out and you won't accept it. They actually start to look up to you a little bit. And uh, they look for you for advice and different things all the time, help in jobs. They're broke. They want to get jobs and stuff like that. We control unions. We control all kinds of things. And we would help people get a job or put them in a union. And so, I mean, I'll give you another example of myself. I mean, I had a pretty tough name, reputation, and I had an office near a school, an elementary school. And um, the head uh, the principal was a female woman. And she came to me and she said, you know, somebody told me, Sammy, this woman wants to talk to you. She's the principal. And I took went in the street and I talked with her. I said, what, what can I do for you? What do you want? She said that the schoolyard at night when the school is closed, kids hang out in there. There's beer bottles that are broken. There's joints that is, you know, still left there or whatever and all kinds of shit. And we have kids. It's an elementary school. These kids are seven, eight, nine, ten years old, whatever they are. Um... Could you help me with that problem? I said, I'll look into it. I don't know. So I grabbed kids, tough kids that are not in the mafia in the neighborhood and said, uh, what kids are hanging out in the schoolyard at night? And they got a couple of kids, a little small little gang, but they're young kids and whatever. And I called them together. And I said, listen, I'm going to the schoolyard at night. I said, clean up before you leave. Don't leave break, broken bottles. Don't leave any kind of drugs. It, was, it wasn't heavy drugs back then. It was just pot, mostly. Um, don't leave that. The little kids in the morning, when they go to school and they go in the schoolyard, that shit's laying all over the place. Go hang out someplace else 
or if you go there, clean it up. If you don't, and they come back and there's stuff there laying there, the next time I call you is I'm going to bust your fucking asses. They always cleaned it up, and actually they went other places and hang out. The, the woman came back, thanked me, and uh, there was a lot of little things. It was always, it was a comfort thing now. They know me, I know them. Um... One day, uh, she came out again, and she wanted to talk to me. And I went out, and I said, you know, what can I do for you? And she said, Sammy, I, I, I obviously know who you are, what you are. She said, there's a car up the block. There's guys sitting in the car, and somebody's watching, been watching you with, you know, the glasses there. And uh, I said, maybe it's a news media. She says, I don't know. So I said, what do you, what do you want me to do? She said, nothing. I, I'm just worried. I see sometimes that guys like you get killed. Maybe somebody's watching you. Maybe they're going to kill you. So I said, you worried about me getting killed? And she said, yeah. Why? She said, because, listen, I, I, I don't go by what your reputation is. You're good for the neighborhood. You're good for the school. You're good for the kids. And I would hate to see you get killed. I said, I know who the car is. I know who they are. They're FBI, and they're watching me. But I thank you. I appreciate it. But just to go to show how people now started to relate to you, didn't want you to get hurt. They knew you were actually good for the neighborhood. You protected people. My daughter opened up a small little florist right next door for me, right near the school as well. And she, you know, come uh, Valentine's Day, kids would come in, they would want to buy flowers for their mother and uh, roses that was expensive. And uh, the kid would come out, you know, let's say it's $3, $4, whatever it was. And the kid would come out with a whole bunch of change. Is that enough? And my daughter's a good person. She took the change and said, yeah, that's enough. And when she went back into school, she told the kids, I bought this for my mom. The next day, there was a pack of kids in there. They all wanted to buy it. <laughs> who had pennies? Who had nickels and dimes? So my daughter said, what do I do? I said, give it to them. They, they, they want to go home with their mom. They don't have, know the value. They're different in money. And uh, But she had a partner. So I said... Get the cost of it. Tell me what the cost is. I'll pay the cost. But give it whatever they give you, the 20 cents, a, a dollar and change, or whatever it is, give it to them. Let them all go home. And the teachers knew what we did, and they loved us for it. They loved my daughter. And my daughter said, well, my, my father paid, you know, the balance because she had a partner. She got a, can't just give everything away. And uh, so we were good for the neighborhood. People didn't hate you. Um, the government hated you all the time, but the people didn't. And uh, if you look at some of the mafia movies like The Godfather, Godfather 1 and 2, you see how they relate to the neighborhoods. It's their family men, they're married, they have husbands, uh, wives, and uh, kids themselves. And we deal with that a lot. So we're, just, we're not just animals hanging out, but we do kill. So... People could say, well, you are an animal. Well, once you kill, you could kill. You know, in prison, I sat with a psychologist one time. And right away, she wanted to talk to me. And uh, and in the conversation, I said, anybody could kill. And she said, no, I can't. So I said, you can't? She said, no. I said, are you married? You have kids? She says, I'm the one who asks the questions. I said, then the conversation is over. If you can't answer a question, then we're not going to talk. So she says, I am married, and I have two beautiful kids. Is one of them a daughter? She said, yeah, I have a boy and a girl. Now, let me give you, ask you a question, a hypothetical question. Some guy gets your beautiful little girl, rapes her so brutally that she dies. 
And then he gets caught. He gets caught, he's found guilty, and he's going to get the electric chair or gas chamber, whatever it is. They're going to put him, put him down. Um, but there's nobody there to press the button. And if nobody comes there within 24 hours, then the thing is off. He goes to jail. He stays in jail 10 years. He's going to hit the streets again. Would you press the button? She looked at me. She says, in a hot minute. Okay. So then under the certain circumstances, you can kill. She put her pad and a pencil down. She said, Sammy, you're right. I can. Under those conditions, I can. And then, in a way, you, you're right. And left. So, I still say that anybody could kill under the circumstances. Women are very close to their children. If you hurt uh, uh, one of their children, they're like, you know, mama bear. They're coming at you. You know, so... It depends on the situation you're in. Sometimes somebody hears that somebody could kill, and they think you're a monster. I'm not a monster. I can kill. I was in the mafia. I was been able to kill when I was in the army. If I became a cop, I would have probably been able to kill in 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 a, the line of duty, or you know, for the right reasons. I don't mean I would have just killed people. I mean, so. Well, let me ask you about that. That's Let me the ask way. about that because <clears throat> a lot of the things you know, you're saying, and what I'm, from what I'm understanding from what you're telling me in regards to if for the right reason justifying this or that within the game of the mafia. Sorry for calling it a game. I'd have just let them with the source next to me. Uh, uh, so, but in regards to that, is there is there a limit? You know what I mean? Like, is there anything going by your head in regards to other means of besides killing people? In a sense that you know. Maybe there's another option, you know, and, and in an environment that the mafia, I know you mentioned the or, the origin story of that it's protection. The mafia is protection from my understanding, but isn't it an environment that the mafia is creating at the same time with the ideation of making money? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Like, is that justification it, it enough becomes... for money and greed, you know? I'm saying, like, if, the justification of someone breaking the rules, breaking the rules and you kill them, but the justification ideation behind the mafia in itself, which is money driven right outside and not just for protection correct i mean it could happen with with some people who are so fucking greedy they'll kill for over money it's not part of what we do that's not supposed to be part now in every fucking face of life there's always people who are going to break rules i don't care what form uh but uh, we don't kill now i'll give you no, another example of that uh, one of my guys, Huck, who was in my crew, he came to me. He said some guy came to him and uh, gave him a message for, for me that um, he was willing to pay $25,000 to me to kill his wife. They were going to get a divorce. So I told Huck, Go back to him and tell him to give us 12,005 up front. And after his wife is dead, he give us the other 12,005. And Hulk looked at me and he said, Sam, I, I thought we don't do that. I said, we're not. We're going to rob him. When he gives us the 125, we're going to keep it. And then I'm going to send you back with a message and tell him, when you want to break up with your wife, there's a divorce court. Go get divorced. We're keeping your money. Now, if you want to go to the cops and tell them that we robbed you for twelve five, go ahead. But tell them why. What the twelve thousand five was for. Obviously, he's not going to go. To, what is he going to say? I wanted them to kill my wife. They robbed me for the twelve five. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. So he was stuck. But you know, so money is important, but. That wasn't part of our lives. That's not definitely not part of mine. I tell anybody, anybody who wants to get rid of their wife, go get, go to court, go to court. And uh, so that's a story about money and uh, 
you know, about making money. Now, some serial killer may say, fuck it, give me the whole 25 and I'll kill your wife. But he's, it would be, he would be a Roy the Mayo type of fucking nut. He's not real. He don't represent us, what we think and what we would do, what we were supposed to do. And he was doing shit like that. That's why he's dead. Okay. Well, what about, what about your experience with, because I, I want to compare the two as someone that's, you know, seen as much violence and murder and death in your life. And I, there seems, there's, there's a divide, there's a, a division between the mafia world and the civilian world. The, not only the rules, just in almost every other way in many ways, even though I can see similarities and how the barbaric the world actually is. But nevertheless, what is your, what is your emotional standpoint from losing someone in the real world? It has nothing to do with the mafia. It has nothing to do with killings. Just losing a loved one in your life. How do you, how do you as someone that's been around death and murder process losing someone close to you that has nothing to do with the mafia? Well, it's horrible. When you love somebody, I mean, if it doesn't break your heart, then you didn't, then you didn't love, love the person. I mean, I stood by my mother's, my father's bed in hospital before he died, and it broke my heart. I miss him till today. Uh, same thing with my mother, and there's the same thing with there's a lot of mafia members as well. Um, I think I'm fairly normal. I feel pain. I feel, like I said, I don't have fear. I have fear. My fear after I saw the movie Jaws, I, don't, I go in the fucking, I'm supposed to be a tough guy. Up to my ankles in water, and I don't want, I don't want to go up to my knees because I don't want a fucking shark to eat me. I'm afraid of that. So I don't go too deep in the water. So I have fear of certain things like that. I have fears like any normal human being. I have pain and suffering like any other normal human being. Even some of the people that were in the mafia died. It broke my fucking heart. But... You know, we're all going to die. Let's be real. It's when and how. But we're all going to lose somebody. We're all going to die. We're all going to feel that pain. But we're all going to accept it in a way because it's life. Nobody's going to live forever. We're going to die. Um, it's, again, a matter of when and how. I'm up in age now. I know I'm, you know, I'm due. I'm overdue. The lifespan for a man is 73. I'm beyond 73. So I know I don't think I got 100 years. I think I got a few years to go, hopefully four, five, six, ten. Who knows? But it's not up to me. It's up to God or whoever it is or whatever it is. But we're all going to die, and we have to accept that. Um, I had a dog, a pit bull. Uh, it was my daughter's dog. When I came out of jail, I wound up with the dog. I was living with my daughter, and uh, I loved the dog. And uh, I took him to the vet, and he says, it's time to put the dog down. I said, why? He said, he's got no more muscle mass. He's in severe pain. Now, I can make him last a little while. You could take him home. You'll be happy. The dog is not going to be happy. He's going to be in pain constantly. So I told him, God, then put him down. I laid down on the floor. Ozzy was his name. I said, Ozzy, come here, baby. And he came in laid on my chest, big, a big pit bull, oversized pit bull. And uh, I was petting him, and he took his paw, put the needle in the, the leg. In a matter of seconds, his body just went limp on top of me. I never had that happen to me, and I just, fuck, I couldn't even move. And I told the doctor, I says, is he dead? He said, yeah. He, I, I couldn't even get him off. I wanted him on me. I just, it, it hurt me so much. And then he said, do you want me to dispose of the body? I, I'll do it in a, in a, you know, a proper manner. Do you want the poor print? And I said, yeah, you dispose of the body. Just do it right. I mean, um, and give me the paw print. So there's ways and things you're going to feel a certain way unless you're a fucking complete nut. And there's not that many people, I don't care who, whether they kill or no kill or whatever, there's not that many people like that. Um, there are some, like I said, there's some in every group. 
You know, there's always a rotten apple in the barrel somewhere. And no matter what walk of life, you know, we talk about things today. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm dead against child you know, abuse and stuff like that. And I do research. I hear things and see things that are just 50,000 times worse than the mafia. Actors, actresses, look what's going on with this fucking guy. What the hell's his name on the island? Epstein. Look what the fuck he did there. But forget about what he did. We all know what he did. Look at the fucking people. Actors, actresses, fucking millionaires, billionaires going to this fucking island over and over and over again. We won't even talk about them. Oh, Sammy the Bull's worse than them. No, I'm not. No, I, you could maybe suck me into that island one time. I'm uh, thinking I'm going to make a deal with this guy and make money. And I look at the island and I say, get the fuck out. I would never go back to that island again. You got, uh, what the hell is his name? Uh, Clinton, President Clinton was there fucking 50 fucking times or 26 times, whatever it was. I mean, what the fuck is he doing at all them times? That's the whole other thing that's been how, how that's the whole it's, other cap, ra rabbit hole of a conversation that it's not talked about. <laughs> it's so wild to me that, <clears throat> of course, you see it in headlines once in a while, and we know why it's not talked about, of course, because of the names and all that bullshit, but it's just wild that something like that just gets brushed under the rug and then we get distracted by some, something completely different that is it's mind-blowing to me. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's washed under the rug. I think that people are in high places and would like to put it, they don't want us to talk about it, and they kill it. They'd rather talk about me. See, I mean, the bullies are fucking killers, a mafioso, and they'll, they'll bear mount the shit out of me, yeah. But they don't want to, because they're doing the same shit. That's the thing I've always said. I was like, <laughs> the, the, uh, the behind the scenes shit of what's running this country, I've always like, it's like, it's like a glorified mafia in, 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 many, in many ways. I'm not comparing them to what your life is, but like what you just said, it's, it's, it seems like it's an organization. <laughs> you know, let me tell you this. I, I remember this when I watched the movie, The, uh, the Godfather. And Michael was talking about his family, his father being in the mafia and his family. And he was marrying this young, beautiful woman. And uh, she obviously didn't like the mafia or what they do. And she tells him at one point when they take a walk, she says, she talks about politician and society and all the good people and everything. And uh, he says his family is good people too. And uh, she says, well, these politicians, you know, they, they don't kill. And he turns around and looks at her and says, are you for real, bro? We start wars. We drop bombs. We kill men, women, and children with these bombs. By the thousands, by the tens of thousands, if not the millions. Are you kidding when you want to say they don't kill? They don't kill like we kill. But they kill 10 times worse than us. But the people don't perceive that in their brain. They can't understand that. Because they give you the bullshit they're protecting our country. The fuck are we doing in Ukraine? It's you humanitarian? People are dying by the hundreds every day. We're sending them billions of fucking dollars. Because they, they, you know how many people are robbing out of those billions? The president of the United States, we just had a catastrophe in Hawaii. He gave each family of four $500. They lost their homes, their cars, their clothes, their food, their medicines, you name it. They lost it all. What the fuck are they going to do with $500, a family of four? They can't even wipe their ass with it. And then he'll turn around and send $20 billion to fucking Ukraine. Hawaii, they're our citizens. They're us. They're our countrymen. So when you get into this subject, there's so many areas that open up doors. And the media don't jump on these things. And they close the doors on a lot of these things. Like you said, it's, it's almost like a secret. Even though you find it out, we're not talking about it. We're not talking about it because we're like half brainwashed. So we'll pick who, who we're going to talk about, who's a bad guy, and everybody else is a good guy. That's bullshit. Yeah, I mean, that's the subjective part of it, especially when you're talking about how people in the neighborhood, you know, 
even though there's some heinous shit going on in regards to violence, people in the neighborhood were seeing what you're doing. And of course, I'm sure it's divided too, where there's people that just don't back it and call you guys monsters, X, Y, Z. But I, I want to, this is, can't, I wasn't planning on even asking this question. We were talking about, you know, the deep state, if you will. Do you have any opinion on with JFK and the mafia's association with the JFK assassination or anything like that? I know a lot about it. I, I mean, I, I know a lot about the JFK, and when I talk about the history of the mafia, which I'm going to do eventually, I'm going to talk about that as well. So I'm really not going to talk about too much of it now, but I do know a lot about it. I mean, uh, it was a little bit before my time. I mean, I remember when uh, I was home, I think I was 18 years old before I went in the military, and I was like, uh, my mother, I was like a bum. I didn't work. I was a crook. I was in the gang. So my mother called me up and she said, did you see the news? I said, what news? I was sleeping. She said, get up, get up, put the news on. They killed the president. So I said, ma, I got nothing to do with it. She says, I know you dumb fuck. I know you have nothing to do with it, but the fuck, go look at the news. <laughs> so I put out the news and I heard the story about JFK got killed. <laughs> I learned a lot about it in the mafia through the years. <laughs> so there's definitely stuff, there's something there. I know that I, I'm not the most historically knowledgeable, but there's something there. <laughs> I'm, glad your mom, I'm glad your mom didn't uh, pinpoint you with the assassination. So we'll get, we'll get that out of the way and clear the air with that. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that always that always interested me again because obviously there was correlation and whatnot. But I, so I, I, I won't press too yeah. much. I'm getting more information yeah, I, out of you there. I'm like, good. I, I, you're not going to get too much more information because I'm going to do stories about it. But I'm getting my hand up that I got something to do and I got about yeah, yeah, five we'll minutes this more. Up. We'll wrap this up. It's to, all good. I think you got a good good uh, podcast. I like you. I, I now you, you ask great questions. You got you listen. You got more out of me than anybody could get. So you were a good uh, interviewer. I didn't think I was going to say this much. So I hope your people, your viewers and thing realize that I'm not the worst guy in the world. I Listen, I have two sides. I have a good side. On my right side, I got little angels. And on this side, I got a lion. So I'm good. But you got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, and you got you to you watch Don't out for uh, jaws below your feet in the two foot of water too. So watch out for that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm horrified of that. I don't want to be fucking dessert or an appetizer for some fucking job. Yeah, stick to the pasta. All right, Sammy, listen, man, I appreciate you taking the time, uh, and I'll uh, I'll love to stay in touch, all that good stuff. If you ever need anything, let me know, but I appreciate the time. There's, I feel like we could have spoke for four more hours. And vice versa. Now, if you want to give me uh, 50000 to get rid of your wife, you know I'm going to rob you. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you, go, go, go to the fucking court. Yeah, and no, the I, yeah, I ain't married, so we'll save that for another day. Yeah, your wife may come to you to get rid of Hey, yeah, I'm going to subliminally send it to you because I know you're just going to keep the money. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right uh, I'll put. Uh, I don't know if you want to drop anything before we get out of here. Uh, how people can find you and whatnot. Just plug yourself for your podcast and everything you got going on if you want. Yeah, our thing dot TV. Um, yeah, I do my. I do a lot of talking in the on that. It's like four ninety nine a month, I think. Right. And what else? And a YouTube channel. If you go to my YouTube channel and you listen to me, if you like, press like and subscribe. And uh, that's important. It does a little good. I, when I, you know, when I go to Hollywood, I push on these heavyweights. And they want to know your numbers. When I got out of prison, they said, well, so we know you're Sammy the Bull, but what's your numbers? I said, what do you mean my numbers? My telephone number? What are you, what are you talking <laughs> about? Bad. They said, no, your numbers. I said, I ain't got no numbers. And they, what they look at is that, you know, if you've got oh, subscribers, yeah, yeah, I got yeah, almost yeah, 600. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because they figure those people, they're watching you, they may go see the movie, and, and it gives you a little clout. So hit subscribe if you like me, and if you like me, hit like. If you don't, change the channel. Get back to this guy <laughs> here. He's got a great I appreciate it, Sam. I got and all, my, all my viewers, this guy's a good guy. I'm going to put you on my show a little bit and see if some of my people come over to you and build your channel. I appreciate a bit. that, Sammy. Send uh, Anna in the background. It's nice to meet you. And I uh, got another episode of Dead Talk, Sammy the Bull. 
Holy shit is all I'm gonna say. And I'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.